Hello, welcome back, free daily bread. Let's start with a prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity, opportunity to glorify you through your word, Lord. And and thank you that you give me your strength that I don't water down your word. I um just teach it for what it is. And um so thank you for for making me bold to do that. And I pray that more hearts are opened for the, the full truth of the counsel of God. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we are in Proverbs chapter 3. My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. Chapter 3, verse 1. So again, Solomon starts off by recognizing his audience as son. That's to identify him as like a teacher or like father, giving fatherly advice. Solomon doesn't mean my law in the sense that he created it, but that he internalized God's word as his own. He is teaching obedience. We should not let God's word slip from our memory or, or neglect it. So the Old Testament is referred to as the law of Moses. The New Testament, after, after the cross, is referred to the law of Christ. Look at Galatians 6.2. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. This is saying that you obey the law by just helping one another. What's that law? That's the law of Christ. So we're no longer under the law of Moses. We're under the law of Christ. Jesus fulfilled the law of Moses by perfecting it. So rather than trying to remember 600 Old Testament commands, we now focus on love. And that love alone will bring obedience. Look at Matthew 12, 32. Wait, 12, 32? Oh, I'm sorry, Mark, Mark. Mark 12, 32. All right, here we go. And the scribe, um, so... Basically, they're talking about um, the commandments. And um, let's see. And the scribe said to him, Well, Master, you have said the truth, for there is one God, and there is none other but he, 33, and to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. God wants your love. He no longer needs us to slay a goat in the backyard, obviously. So, love. The Old Testament law is bondage to one's own works for salvation. Look at Galatians 3.23. Three twenty-three, but before faith came, what's what's that? That's Jesus. All right, the faith is Jesus. Faith in Jesus. But before faith came, we were kept under the law. What's that? The law of Moses. We were shut up unto. That means we were controlled by that until what? The faith which should afterwards be revealed. So. The old law only looked forward to Jesus. Jesus was the fulfillment of the old law. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster, that means our teacher, to bring us to Christ. So the old law, like the, ten, like the commandments and all that, okay, that's only to show us that we are a sinner and that we need a, save, a savior, Okay, that's what the law does, that we might be justified justified by faith. So, the law only shows us we need Jesus, because nobody can perfect the law. 
Once you sinned just one time, you broke the whole law and you now need a savior. Okay. But after that faith has come, that's, that's Jesus, our faith in Jesus. We are no longer under a school master. We're no longer under the old law. Okay. I know it's a little confusing for some people to understand this. So I'm just going to try to explain this as easy as I can. Faith alone, okay, is, is how we are now saved. There's no longer no works that are needed. Look at Ephesians 2 verse 8. For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Here we go. Faith alone in the works of the cross is how we are saved. None of your good works. Even your good works are filthy rags to the Lord. Okay? So when we come to Christ... It's nothing that you, we don't earn salvation, okay? It Look, it's a gift. So let's say someone gets you a birthday present, okay? They give it to you. And then the next day you go and work and then you give them the money for the gift. Therefore, it's not a gift anymore, okay? So salvation is a gift. It's free. All you need is faith. It's so easy, Religions have ruined this. Like Catholicism, they say faith plus works. Okay? No. It's only faith alone. Amen. The problem is this. Many now use the fact that since we are now under the since we are not under the old law as an excuse to sin. Okay? Look at Romans 6 15. What then shall we say? Because we are not under the law, but under grace, God forbid. Okay, so these are people who, um, who think just because they're under God's grace that that's a license to sin. No, grace teaches holiness. It's not a license to sin. Amen. For the true follower of Christ, this is easy. Love alone is the motivator to obey God. When one knows the value of Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf, the true believer responds with a gratitude and, and an obedience. Our repentance comes from loving God more than our sin. Okay? It's not about checking off religious traditions to earn his favor. Obedience is easy for the born-again Christian because of their love for Jesus. Look at John 14, 15. Look, plain and simple, if you love me, what? Keep my commandments. Do you love God? Well, then you should be keeping his commands. To love someone and obey them means you must know him first. Look at 1 John 2, 3 in the back. And hereby we do know that we know him if we what keep his commands. How do you how can you test someone's fruit? And how can you examine your own faith that you're truly saved? Well, because we know that we know him how if we keep his commands. Are you keeping God's commands? Well, then that means you're probably saved. Okay? You just got to examine your faith. Um because that's the fruit of it, obedience. Look at four. He that says, I know him and keeps not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Those who think they can live in just any old habitual sin, what's that? That's someone who, that's a liar and they don't have the truth. But whoever keeps his word in him, right? That's in your heart. 
in not just reads the Bible, but lives the Bible in him verily is the love of God perfected hereby know we that we are in him. How do you know that Christ is in you? Well, you keep his word. He that says he abides in him ought himself ought to, ought to also walk even as he walked to be Christ-like. Okay? You will know them by their fruit. Those who think grace is a license to sin is a deceived liar. Because why? Grace teaches holiness. So one not living in obedience is one not working with God's Grace. Look at Titus 2.11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. All right, so this means anyone can be saved. Verse 12. Here we go. What does God's grace teach us? 12. It teaches us this. God's grace teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Is grace a license to continue living in sin? No. Grace teaches holy living. Grace is a teacher. Amen. Amen. God's grace instructs, it disciplines, and it corrects. That's what God's grace does. If someone can easily live in any old sin, that means they're not being instructed, they're not being disciplined, and they're not being corrected, and they are a liar. You will know one by their lifestyle who is truly working with God's grace. Those are the ones that, look, in verse 1, keep his, keep commands in their, in their, um, in their heart. Those are the ones that are doing that. Christianity is not a religion. It is a relationship, and he wants your heart. This will cause a person to stay diligently in his word and meditate on it day and night. Look at Joshua 1 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then shall you make the way prosperous, and then shall you have good success. That's amazing. Study. And obey, and God will be with you. Obedience does not come before salvation. Okay? It comes after salvation. That's the fruit of being saved is obedience. Look at Psalms 119.15. I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto your ways. Do you, do you respect God's ways? If you do, that means you're meditating in his word, in his precepts, in his commands. Amen. Look, look at 16. I will delight myself in your statutes. Those are his commands, his law. I will not forget your word. Amen. It's very easy to forget God's word if you're not in the Bible. Do you delight yourself in, in, in God's statutes? Do you delight being obedient to the Father? Do you meditate on his word? That's the born-again Christian. Look at verse 9, or look at uh, 97, 119, 97. Oh, how I love the law. It is my meditation all the day. All the day. Stay in Psalms. Look at 77 verse 12. 
I will meditate also of all thy work and talk of your doings. Do you meditate on, on just the wondrous things that God does? Do you talk about him? That's what Christians do. They, if you love someone, that's what you talk about the most. How is it so many so-called Christians never talk about Jesus? We are always to met when you're meditating on him day and night. That's what you also talk about. Look at 1914. I'm going backwards. <laughs> 1914. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Look, the words of my mouth. That means your speech. Is your speech glorifying God? And when you meditate, that's coming from your heart. And when you, when you meditate from your heart and you speak to glorify God, those are the ones that are acceptable in the sight of God. Because he is our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Speech in your heart should be aligned with God. This happens after you're born again. Look at 104 verse 34. My meditation of him shall be sweet. I will be glad in the Lord. Amen. It's a lot of people think the Bible is bitter and scary and full of wrath. The, those people is because they're not good with the Lord. Those who are good with the Lord find the Bible to be sweet. Those are the ones that are glad in the Lord. Last one, look at 1 Peter one twenty three. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. That's amazing. Born again. God's word is alive. To meditate on it in your heart is the one that pleases God. Amen. Lost my spot. Back to Proverbs 3, verse 2. For the length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Verse 2. So in principle, those who obey God will live a long life of peace. So this is not a promise, but only a principle. This means one who obeys God is living a life worth living for. God gives his children a supernatural peace, which makes us useful to do his will and serve him while we are here. And his servants will indeed have eternal life, which John, what's John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should what? Have everlasting life. So this can be spiritual right here, for sure. Look at um, John 12, 26. Twelve twenty six. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Amen. Amen. Are you serving God? Because only his servants are going to heaven. Many live a very long life without Christ and never experience this true peace. It's very sad. True peace is internal. It's not just your atmosphere. A persecuted Christian in China 
has more internal peace than a monarch on his throne. Look at Isaiah 9, 6. This is a popular one. You can show this to a Jehovah Witness. This is about the prophecy of Jesus coming into the world. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. That means he will rule the world. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God. See the Mighty God? Show this to a Jehovah Witness. That's capital G. Jesus is God. The Everla and he's also called the Everlasting Father. How? Well, it's the Trinity. But well, here's my whole point. Look, he's the Prince of Peace. Amen? Beautiful. One not at peace with God is not one at peace in life. Uh, look at Romans 5.1. Therefore, being justified by faith, that means we're saved by faith alone. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The anchor of truth. Justified by faith. Our faith alone brings us peace with God. Amen. Proverbs, verse 3. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them about your neck. Write them upon the table of your heart. This is beautiful. Solomon says to what? To how to, to keep mercy and truth close. Don't let it forsake. That means don't let it leave you. Don't let mercy and truth leave you. God gives us mercy and truth, and his children will only reflect in the same nature. Look at Hosea 4.1, minor prophet, after Daniel. Hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel. For the Lord has a controversy, that means a charge, with the inhabitants of the land. Because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. When This is when his people were being disobedient. And when you're disobedient to God, what happens? You have no truth. You have no mercy. And you have no knowledge of God. That's intense. Those with no mercy and no truth are not in Christ. Look at Isaiah 59, 14. And judgment is turned away backward, and justice stands afar off. For truth is fallen in the street, and equity, that word can mean truth also, cannot enter. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. There is no proper judgment when not working with mercy and truth. When there's no mercy and truth, then there's no proper judgment. That's justice. All right. Judgment is turned away when there's no mercy and truth. We see that today. Mercy. Okay, this is what mercy means. Mercy, it shuts out all selfishness and hate, and it gives compassion to one in need. Kind of, it's having pity. Having pity is mercy in action. Look at Matthew 5, 7. Five, seven. This is a list of who is blessed. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Well, wow. Amen. God has mercy 
on those who are merciful. God gives mercy to those who are merciful. That's amazing. This is the fruit of the Spirit. This also comes with forgiveness. Look at, stay here, look at 615. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. If there's someone that you can't forgive, guess what? God can't forgive you. That's intense. You expect God to forgive you, but you can't forgive someone else. Mercy also is to have a sympathy to put immediate action for one in need, whether physical or emotional. The biblical love is self-sacrifice. Mercy is more than a feeling. It is always followed by action. And it's done cheerfully, okay? When you're born again, we do this cheerfully. Look at Romans 12.8. Or he that exhort exhorts or on I'm sorry, or he that exhorts on exhortation, he that gives, let him do it with simplicity, that means generosity. He that rules, that means the one that leads with diligence, that means to do best, he that shows mercy with cheerfulness. That's amazing. Those who are born again, when they do good for others. They're happy to do it. Amen. So, uh, so basically, the mercy you show to others is a mercy God gives you. It's not. <clears throat> Let me take a drink. It's not for merits with God. It's just a fruit from one who loves Christ. And note, um, Christians are very merciful people, but that doesn't mean this wicked world will give it back. <laughs> okay, so don't expect mercy from those who have no truth. Only those with mercy from God can show mercy. It comes with, um, this mercy comes with freedom because God gives us mercy that the mercy that we didn't deserve salvation. Okay. We didn't deserve salvation, but with God's mercy, he gave it to us because he's a merciful God. Amen. Mercy is freedom. So a lot of people who are not merciful is because they're not free. People confused people who are confused will think that mercy and grace is a license to excuse sin or tolerate others living in willful sin i will often hear well just have mercy and grace on them i'm all right so no sin is never pitied it's only the human that is pitied and if you love another, your mercy and your truth will guide them to, to, to submit to Christ. If they reject is not your problem. There is no clear definite, there's no clear definition of mercy than what Jesus did on the cross. And woe to those who reject that mercy. And unfortunately, the majority don't want God's mercy. It's very sad. So mercy and grace is not to tolerate sin. Mercy and grace leads people to truth. So this mercy is truth. This mercy and truth is to be what? In verse 3, binded, that means tied around your neck. That means mercy and truth is fastened tight to the individual, like a necklace, like ornaments that represent you. That's amazing. 
one always walking in obedience to Christ is the one with the necklace of truth and mercy. And also look and write, all right, write what? Write mercy and truth where? Upon the table of your heart. That's amazing. Look at Jeremiah 31, 33. Thirty-one to thirty-four is beautiful, but I'm just reading thirty-three. Yes, thirty-three. But this shall be the covenant. This is the the new covenant of Christ that I will make with the house of Israel. Yes, Jesus, God is going to keep His promise to the Jews. They will be saved. After those days, says the Lord. After what days? Well, this is this is the seven-year tribulation. Okay. They're going to know that Jesus is Messiah during that time, one third of them. And what's going to happen? I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. <laughs> Amen. Amen. That's beautiful. God will keep his promise. Um, look at uh, 2 Corinthians 3.3. 3. The most important thing in the Bible is to know the difference between church and, uh, and the Jews and Israel. Never get them mistaken. Um, 2 Corinthians 3.3. 3. Wait, 2 Corinthians, yes, 3.3. 3. Okay. For as so much... As you are manifestly declared to the epistle of Christ. Look, this is amazing. Paul is calling us, is referring to us as, as, as if we are a manifested letter of Christ. Ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. Not in tables of stone, but in the fleshy tables of the heart. Wow. Wow. God's word is like delivered spiritually and you become yourself a walking letter of Christ. That's amazing. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. How amazing that the Christian is like a walking book of God's commands. His commands are embedded into our heart and those are the ones who meditate on his word day and day night his law becomes our nature internally the christian is not a, a building on sunday i'm sorry the church is not a building on sunday the christian is the church and the christian is the one that is a walking epistle of christ four so shall you find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. These people who don't forget God's law are the ones who what? Find favor, that word can mean grace, and good understanding. That means discernment between good and evil. So this brings grace and discernment. To learn Christianity is to get a solid understanding about it. Look at Genesis 6, 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Look at that. One man out of the whole world found grace in the eyes of God. Well, Jesus said in the last days, it will be like the days of Noah. Hardly anybody will be faithful. And this will not only be recognized in the sight of God, when you have this understanding in grace and truth and mercy, it's also recognized, look in verse 4, by men. Okay, look at Genesis 39 verse 4. This is about Joseph and Joseph found grace in his sight and he served him 
and he made him overseer of his house and all that he had to put into his house. This is when Joseph's brothers, 11 brothers, sold him to Egypt. Okay? And in Pharaoh found grace in his sight on Joseph. I'm sorry, with Pharaoh. Because he was a man of God. Joseph had mercy and truth and understanding and and that brings us a respect from other people. Um look at 1 Samuel 2:26. This is about let me see here 1 Samuel 2:26. Samuel here. And the child, this is when Samuel was a child. And the child Samuel, Samuel grew on, that means grew up, and was in favor both with the Lord and also with men. Favor. That means grace. A good report. A godly man is normally respected, but the closer we get to the end, the godly man is most hated okay so again solomon gives principles not facts um it's not always guaranteed facts but um oh and jesus grew up in this favor look at luke 252 And Jesus increased, this is when he was growing up. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. The favored, they favored him until what? Well, until he started teaching repentance. That was his first word in his ministry. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is near. So just be aware this world belongs to Satan currently, and it hates truth speakers. Look at John 15, 18. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. It's no surprise. Are you hated by this world? Well, Jesus already said that we would be. If you are a Christian who is speaking truth in these last wicked days, the world will hate you. Look, if you are of the world, the world would love his own. The world will love you if you were like the world. But because you are not of the world and I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Be in good cheer if you are not of the world. That means God has chosen you, has pulled you away from the world to represent him. Amen. Verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and, lead, and lean not unto your own understanding. This is a popular one, popular one right here. Verse 5. But the Christian doesn't fear being hated. Okay. They don't fear being hated for trusting in the Lord with all their heart. Lord, this word Lord, all right, in, in the Old Testament, that means Yahweh, okay? Jesus is Lord, and he indeed is worthy to be trusted. This is one main reason people can't submit to Christ. They don't know him, so therefore they can't trust him, okay? It's kind of like a woman Let's say you're in public, you're a woman, you have a purse. And you need someone to hold on to your purse. You're not going to turn around and ask a complete a man that's a complete stranger to hold your purse. Why? Well, because you don't know him. That's just like God. If you don't know him, therefore you can't trust him. Trust means to, the word trust means to lie helpless. That means total dependence look at matthew 18 3 and jesus says verily i say to you except you be converted 
and become as little children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. If you don't become like a, a two-year-old like two child who trusts in their parent 100%, you will not go to heaven. Well, total dependence on God. Those are the ones that are going to heaven. One not in God's word cannot trust him because they don't know him. If you're not in his word, you don't know God. Therefore, you can't trust him. Therefore, they don't really trust his promises. They don't, they don't trust his direction or his protection. And they can't rely on his strength alone. Pride is the main obstacle why people can't trust God. To trust God 100% means you have died to yourself and you allow him alone to lead. People who have this, this is a saving faith, okay? People who have this saving faith are those who will not lean on their own understanding. They only lean on God. Those who only trust themselves are normally very anxious, depressed, and people who live in fear. They think they are in control of their own future. This is a carnal confidence of stubbornness. One who can't trust God is one not saved. Look at Romans 10.10. 10. For with the heart, man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So, one who can't trust God is one not saved. With the heart, man believes. With the mouth, confession made to salvation. I'm sorry, confession is made unto salvation. Amen. Look at 11. Whoever believes on him shall not be ashamed. Are you ashamed to give the gospel or to maybe evangelize or talk about Jesus to anyone? Are you ashamed? Examine your faith if you are. Look at Ephesians 4.18. Four eighteen, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God. All right, so this is this is people who. Let me start in seventeen. This is taking off the old man, putting on the new man. Seventeen. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. So this is talking about how unbelievers walk because they have the understanding darkened, their minds are darkened they because why they're alienated from the life of god through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart that's intense their minds are darkened and scripture also says the god of this world satan is the one that blinds the minds of people who are alienated of god it's ignorance No feelings for truth at all. But when one truly has a saving faith is one who can easily trust God because he gives them a new heart. Look at Ezekiel 36, 26. This was, these were my favorite verses when I first got saved. It's beautiful. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you. And what's going to happen when God gives you his spirit and he gives you a new heart? 
It will cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. It brings obedience. You will know them by their fruit who has this new heart. Amen. Notice the word lean back in Proverbs. Lean not. Lean um, is a is a that means that is a constant need every second of the day. We are commanded to trust God, and those who don't are fools and they live in self sufficiency and self dependence. And they choose to live independently from God. Today, the world screams independence. I'm an independent woman, you'll hear all the time. This comes with feminism. But God says, only depend on me. You will never find one verse in here talking about your own independence. Okay? The Christian is humble. The Christian is humble enough to admit they need God every second of the day. The prideful refuse and, and they trust in themselves only. They refuse God's guidance. People will say Christianity, that you'll get mocked often, is only a crutch for the weak. As if that's an insult. My response is yes. I am weak and need God. Okay, so this ignorant world will think it's an insult that we that we admit that we're weak and we need God. They find that to be insulting because it ruins their pride. The prideful will never admit their weakness. And that is why they can't stop habitual sin because they are not working with God's strength. They lean on their own mere human understanding. Six. In all the ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. We must look, look, acknowledge God. When one trusts God, they invite God to lead in everyday life and everyday conduct. These people acknowledge the presence of God throughout the whole day. All daily activities and decisions from the Christian is to glorify the obvious presence of God in their life. We acknowledge him by seeking his, wide, his wise aid. And notice, what word is in the middle of acknowledge? Well, it's no. That's interesting. Hold on, sorry, I lost my spot here. So, wait, I'm way off right now. Hold on. All right, here we go. <laughs> it's no. That's amazing. In the middle of acknowledge is no. So one must know God to acknowledge him. Okay? His word guides us. Let me take a drink. Look at Psalms 119.24. I'm very calm with this teaching today. I just feel like I'm just flowing here. <laughs> very peaceful. The last couple teachings were very intense. All right, where am I at? 119.24. 119.24. Yes, this is the day which the Lord has made we will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. The Lord has made this day. Rejoice. Let him lead you. He's the one that made it. <laughs> Those, um, so we walk in the spirit, okay? Not in the flesh. Those are the ones that God, what? In verse six, directs their paths. Man cannot direct themselves. The Christian is led by God every hour of the day. Look at Jeremiah 10, 23. Oh, 
O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walks to direct his paths. Look at that. The way of man is not himself. You are the way. That's amazing. Wow. But for the prideful, it's all about themselves in doing what they want to do. Did you know your life is not your own? Okay. We belong to God. Amen. So he's the one that guides the feet of his saints. It is a, a load of relief to give God all control. It is a burden that is just lifted off your, your shoulders. It really is. Trust him. Verse 7. Be not wise. In thine own eyes, fear the Lord and depart from evil. Verse 7. Look, don't be wise in your own eyes. That goes on the fridge. To do so means you think you know more than God. These are prideful, puffed up, conceited people who don't think they need God's wisdom. There is no greater enemy to God than one living in this self-conceit. These people will tell, they will take no godly advice and they glory only in themselves. Look at Isaiah 521. Woe unto me. Woe unto them. This is a woe to those who, who do this. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Well, spiritual pride. These are people in rebellion to God and what happens in verse 7? They don't fear the Lord, okay? Nor do they depart from evil. They don't fear the Lord and they definitely don't depart from evil, okay? You'll know them by their fruit. When one doesn't fear God, they then become their own God, little g, with their own moral code. That's intense. They don't care about offending God. They only worry others will offend them with the truth. And this is the majority, even so-called professing Christians. They're not really Christians. Um, look at Matthew 24, 10. A Christian loves truth. 24, 10. What's it going to be like in the last days? By the way, Matthew 24 is for Israel. It's for the Jews. This is not the church. This is what happens during the tribulation. Um, 2410. And then, but what will happen? Many shall be what? Offended. And shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Well, we're, so, we're already seeing this. But it's going to get... A million times worse. Look, they shall betray one another. This reminds me of um, the Holocaust. Well, there's a time coming upon this world that you can't even comprehend. Truth to turn from sin and seek God offends people okay tell someone to repent from their habitual sin see who gets offended do you know how many i tell to start reading the bible and they get offended by just telling them they should read the bible the most loving message i can bring they find offensive these people do not depart from evil since they have no real fear of God, they remain in their sin. 
The Christian, on the other hand, now hates evil and avoids it like a plague. Look at it. Stay here. Look at 16, 6. 16, 6. By mercy and truth, iniquity, that means sin, is purged. That means done away. Look at this. The one who is working truly with God's mercy and God's truth is done with sin. Why? Well, because they fear the Lord and they departed from evil. Those who are living in habitual sin are not working with mercy and truth. They don't fear God. That's intense. Many will say, Lord, Lord, he said, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Wow. Look at Nehemiah 5.15. Backwards. Okay, so... Um, there were some governors um, taking advantage of people, okay? But the former governors that had been before me were chargeable. That means they were charging the people and had taken them bread and wine besides 40 shekels of silver. Yes, even their servants bear rule over the people. So this is about um, leaders that were taking advantage of the people. But look what Nehemiah says. But so did not I. He said, but I didn't do that because why? Because I fear, because of the fear of God. Okay. Nehemiah didn't take advantage of people because he feared God. He, the one who fears God is not comfortable to sin. Like I said, look how many so-called Christians can't depart from old sin. You will know them by their fruit. Who truly fears the Lord? Oh, back in three. Okay, verse eight. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to the bones. A life surrendered to Christ and fears him has real health benefits. I'm not preaching the health and wealth prosperity word of faith right here fearing god let me take a drink but does god do miracles today absolutely fearing god and leaving sin brings health to the navel in verse eight that, that word navel means flesh we can be talking about the whole body right now but the navel is the central region of the body which holds all the vital organs. God brings us nourishment physically and spiritually. Again, this is principle, a principle from Solomon. It's not a promise. But one saved will indeed get healthier. How? Well, most of them, well, you should stop smoking, stop drinking, stop doing drugs, stop living in fornication. Okay, sin wrecks havoc on a body. Full healing is not promised when becoming a Christian, but your spiritual health will indeed be strengthened. Look at 2 Corinthians 4.16. For which cause we faint not. That means we have boldness. But though our art, oh, oh sorry, ugh, though our outward man perishes, all right, our, our body is dying, decaying every single day. But look, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Our body decays, it's dying daily. Okay. But your spirit. Your inward man is, is just reviving day by day by day, getting more and more and more in the image of Christ. That's amazing. And look, and it says marrow to the bones in verse 8. 
This is nourishment for your bones. Marrow mean that word means watering. It's 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 refreshing to finally trust God. I'm telling you, <laughs> it's very refreshing. Look at Proverbs, stay in Proverbs, look at 17, 22. A merry heart does good like medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. Wow. A happy heart is like good medicine. This reminds me. What did Jesus tell the Pharisees when they came and said, why are you eating with sinners? He said, he's like a doctor. He didn't comfort those who don't think they don't need a doctor. He came for those that do know that they need a doctor. Amen. So, this is, the, again, this is not a promise for healing bones and, and physical strength. Okay, it's not a promise. But you will indeed, like I said, become spiritual your spirit becomes stronger when you're born again. Look at 1 Timothy 4, 8. For bodily exercise, this is like uh, your gym membership, okay? That profits very little, Paul says. I'm sorry. Yeah, this is Paul. But godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. Physical exercise is good, okay? But your spiritual exercise is better. When you're born again, you're going through sanctification. That means you're, it's like an exercise. And you're getting stronger and stronger and stronger in Christ. Watering to the bones. I love that. It gives you water to the bones. This is the opposite of dry bones. And dry bones represents one who is spiritually dead. Look at Ezekiel 37. My Christians, you know where I'm going. So, I love this. In your own time, read the whole chapter of 37. This is the Valley of Dry Bones. I'm not going to go through it all. But Ezekiel gets a uh, some sort of vision, okay? And God takes him to this valley, and it's filled with a whole bunch of bones, okay? And um, this is about the prophecy that the Jews are going to be saved in the last days. The, boom, the bones represent the Jews right now in their state of unbelief, okay? Okay. Um, so that's verse 1, full of bones. I'm just going to skim through this. Verse 3. God says, son of man. I love that. He calls uh, Ezekiel son of man so many times. Can these bones live? And he's answered, only God, you, only you would know. That's amazing. Well, can these bones live? Wow. God says, prophesy upon these bones and say to them, oh, you dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. I love this. Thus says the Lord God unto these bones, behold, I will cause breath. What's the breath? That's the Holy Spirit to enter into you and you shall live. And I will lay sinews, that means muscles. He will refresh in them, give them muscles. You will bring up flesh upon you. That means they will grow flesh again and, and cover with skin and put breath in you. And you shall live and you shall know that I am Lord. Amen. This is a revival in the last days for the Jews. So Ezekiel did, he prophesied and he did this. And guess what? And they started shaking. The bones started, who said the Bible is boring? Okay. They started shaking and the bones came together bone to bone. All right. So skeletons are actually being formed. And then the, the muscles are growing on them. Skin is covering, but there's no breath in them yet. Okay. So now it's a bunch of like skeletons and, and it's basically people, but they're not breathing. Okay, this is like bringing the Jews back to Israel. All right, they're all back to Israel, but they don't have the spirit of God yet. He says, prophesy to the wind, 
um, come upon the four winds, a breath, and breathe upon these that are. So the breath is basically the spirit of God. That's the Holy Spirit. So I prophesied, and the breath, that's the Holy Spirit, came into him, came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet. That's amazing. A great army. <laughs> Then he said, I wasn't going to read this all, but I can't help it. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole, look, here we go. This is how you know it's Israel. These are the whole, this is the whole house of Israel. This is the 12 tribes. Amen. Behold, they say our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off of all parts. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, O my people, that's the Jews, I will open your graves. I will cause you to come out of the graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O oh my people, and brought you up out of your graves. And you shall put my spirit in you, and you shall live. And I shall place you in your own land. Then shall you know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. How can you not get emotional when you're reading this? This is the second coming of Christ, okay? People teach something that's a heresy. They teach um, replacement theology. They teach that God is done with the Jews and the church replaced the promises of Israel. That is a lie from the devil. No, he will keep his word. Amen. So, read that whole chapter when you can chance. Well, I just did anyways. So, so this refers to the great revival of the Jewish um, believers during the Great Tribulation. This is when he takes their, their veil off and they know Jesus is Messiah. One third will believe. Let me show you where this comes from. Look at Zechariah 13, 9. Wait, I'm way off. There we go. 13.9. Let's start in 8. This is about the God re refining. And it, and it shall come to pass that in all the land, says the Lord, when it when it comes, this is during the tribulation. Two parts therein shall be cut off and die. This is ter This is sad. Two thirds of the Jews are going to actually not believe in Jesus still. They're going to fall for the Antichrist. They're going to perish. But the third, that's one third, shall be left alive. And I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name and I will hear them. I will say it is my people and they shall say the Lord is my God. Amen. They're going to know Jesus is Messiah. That's amazing. So there's like, I believe it's like 15 million Jews. Um, so uh, unfortunately, there's a time coming where 10 million Jews are going to perish. It's going to be way worse than the Holocaust. Um, but one third will live around 5 million. So, hey, I'm just reading the Bible. He keeps his promise though. Um, yeah, those who say God is done with the Jews are Nazi liars. They're not Christians at all. So those who teach this replacement th theology, they have no spiritual health. Moving on, verse 9. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. Now we get into your possessions. We are to honor the Lord with our substance. What God has given us is to please God, not just ourselves. We glorify God with every item that we buy. Substance is what we earned from our labors. So how do you spend God's money? Because that's not your money. Are you content also with what you have or do you covet? Do you help others in need? Look, can you hear my cat? <laughs> Calm down, kitty. 
um, yeah, helping others in need also. So we learned about, we learned about mercy. Okay. That's a form of helping the poor. So do you honor God by, by flowing your money somehow through the church? And, and this is, it doesn't mean a building. When I talk about the church, I'm talking about us. Okay. Not a building, but do you directly help one in need? Look at Proverbs 13, I'm sorry, 14, 31. He that oppresses, that means mistreats the poor, reproaches, that means insults his maker, that means God. Those who mistreat the poor insults God. But he that honors him, honors God, has mercy. That means kindness on the poor. That's amazing. Wow. Do you honor God? Well, then you have mercy on the poor. One who does not have mercy on the poor does not honor God. So, also, there's a lot of people who are homeless, all right? a lot of homeless men who can work, okay? So we need to have discernment. Because the Bible also says that the one who does not work is one who does not eat. So you need to have discernment when we're talking about the poor and on, on who to give to, um, give God's money to. You better make sure it's because they can't work. They're not capable. All right. So that's why mostly we focus on widows, um, single parents, single mothers with, with children, orphans. Okay, people who are more helpless. Amen. So, or, or, and also, do you, do you store up your treasures and money for only yourself? Look at Matthew 25, 31. At the end of the... At the second coming, the end of the tribulation, God is going to, Jesus is going to do something called the separation of the sheep and the goats. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, verse 31, and all the holy angels with him, this is the second coming. This is not the rapture, okay? This is at the end of the of the seven-year tribulation, and he shall put set upon the throne of his glory, amen, that's in Jerusalem, and before him shall he gather all nations and shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. The sheep are his. The sheep are tribulation saints and the believing Jews. Okay. After the rapture, there's going to be a great, there's going to be a revival. Those people who believe in Christ during the tribulation and actually survived the seven year tribulation are going to be gathered into like an area it seems in the goats those are the unbelievers are going to be gathered into another area and he shall set the sheep on his right hand but the goats on the left then shall the seeing the king say to them his right hand come you blessed of my blessed of my father inherit the king and prepared for you the foundation of the world so blessed are you welcome welcome to the kingdom okay look for i was hungered you gave me meat Meat means food. I was thirsty, you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick, you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me, okay? Then the righteous said, when? When did we feed you and give you a drink? And when did we clothe you and visit you, okay? So, and then in 40, he said, "When basically when you do for the needy, you're doing it for me, amen? But look at, in 41, um, then shall he say unto them on the left hand, these are the goats, depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepare for the devil and his angels. That's terrifying. And, and what was the reasons why, one of the reasons why he says, because I was hungered, you gave me no food. I was thirsty. You gave me no drink. I was a stranger. You didn't take me in. You didn't clothe me. You didn't, when I was sick, you didn't help me. Okay. You get the point here. Then shall they also say, when, when were you hungry? When was you, when did you need clothes? Okay. When were you sick? And because they didn't get that when they're doing for the poor, they're doing it for God. Okay. So 
those who didn't honor God with their substance went to hellfire. Again, the biblical love is sacrifice and obedience. To sacrifice is to go without for another to receive. So what do you sacrifice to serve and honor God? Or is it all about you and your own needs? And if, and if you can't afford to give because you are the poor one, I have an answer for you. Look at Acts 3, 6. This is after they received the Holy Spirit. Peter is out healing people. Then Peter, all right, so there's a guy, he's lame. He's looking at Peter and John, all right, thinking that he's going to give him money. But Peter says, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have given, wait, but such as I have, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Nazareth, rise up and walk. I'm not telling that you can walk around and healing people. What I'm saying, you don't need silver and gold to evangelize. Amen. That's free. You don't need money to evangelize. And it's the best gift one could give. And matter of fact, we should all be giving God's word to the lost in these last days. Also notice, let me take a drink. Um, also notice God should always get the first fruit in verse 9. The first fruits of all thine increase. God is not a waitress that we tip. He is a king who deserves the best. So in the Old Testament, the Jews brought the firstlings that's, uh, of their flock, okay? And the first fruits of their fields. This was their way of acknowledging God's goodness and sovereignty, okay? Let me just show you. Look at Exodus 13, verse 1. Um... Uh, wait, 13, one, sorry, hold on one and two. Moses spoke, uh, sanctify unto me all the firstborn whatsoever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both of man of the look, even the firstborn uh, of children and man was dedicated to the Lord. This is referred to the first fruit. Okay. Also. Sorry, hold on. Look at Leviticus 23, verse 9. And the Lord said to Moses, saying, oh, so, so the first fruits is 9 to 14. I'm just going to read the verse 10. Speak unto the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I give unto you, you shall reap the harvest thereof. Then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest and the priest is going to give that as a sacrifice to as an offering to the lord and that wasn't for salvation this was for thanks okay so that's what we do to god we um we give him okay um acknowledgement of his goodness and that he provides for us so Um, oh, and look at verse 10. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. I'm trying to get to 12. Those who honor God with their substance is the ones who will get, look, filled, bar filled barns with plenty. Okay? This, again, is not a fact, but just a principle. That God is the master and distributor of unlimited sources. He knows how to provide for those who honor him with the, sub with the substance he has given to them. Look at Matthew 6.31.
Therefore, take no not. Don't worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What will we do for clothes? 32, for all these things do the Gentiles seek. That basically, that basically means unbelievers. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. All right? So, 33, but seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Amen. Only unbelievers worry about provisions. Amen. Only unbelievers worry about needs. The Christian worries not. Look at Philippians 4.19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Amen. Are you in Christ Jesus? He's going to supply all your needs. Amen. Your needs, not your wants. Know the difference. God will also, what? It says um, in verse 10, burst your presses with new wine. We need to take in consideration the culture of this time with this speech. So a press is where grape juice flowed through the pipes, okay, from, from being pressed on. And note, new wine, is, that means fresh from the vine, okay? It's non-alcoholic. It's simply grape juice. Look at Matthew 26, 29. This is the last supper, but I say to you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine. What's the fruit of the vine? Grape juice. Until that day when I drink it new, look, it's new, fresh off the vine with you in my father's kingdom. They were not drinking alcohol. Okay. This was grape juice at the last supper. Just had to clarify that. Um, so, God will provide for your essential needs is what Solomon is saying in verse 10. Verse 11. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be wary of his correction. Now Solomon jumps to a different subject. Now he gets into discipline and correction from God. He says, don't despise that means have no, that means one who has no concern for the Lord's chastening. That means discipline. Only a humble person will take God's correction, discipline, and instruction. This teaches God's path and brings the person into his submission. Just like how a child should obey their parents is how we obey God. Discipline comes from the loving parent who wants best for their child's welfare. One who refuses God's correction is a prideful, stubborn, disobedient person who refuses um, knowledge. Okay, These then can easily live in habitual sin because they are weary. Okay, They're tired of God's correction. Where does it say that? Yeah, don't be wary of his correction. Most people, oh, I'm so tired of him telling me what to do. Yeah, that's what most people say. I'm tired of God telling me what I can and can't do. I'm going to take advantage of his grace and do what I want. These people then hide behind the excuse of God's grace to continue living in sin. They refuse correction and they love their sin. The scary part is if God doesn't bring correction, is that how they can live in sin because they're not being disciplined at all? Is that person his child? Look at Hebrews 12, 7. If you endure chastening, that means discipline, God deals with you as with his son, as with sons. For what son is he whom father? 
whom he, the father, chastens not. God disciplines his children, okay? Just like a loving parent will discipline their children. But if you be without chastisement, if you have no discipline from God, we're of all partakers, then you are bastards and not sons. That's terrifying. So basically, those who do not receive discipline from God are illegitimate children. They're not his. Hey, I'm just reading the Bible. Just like earthly parents don't discipline children who are not theirs, neither does God. God's discipline is love. So, re so to refuse God's discipline is telling him to stop loving you and let you run your life the way you want. These people, God will hand them over because he will not force his love on no one. He invites and then he waits for an open invitation in return. Look at Revelation 3.20. The Laodicean church, whether Jesus is outside knocking on the door trying to get in, behold, verse 20, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. That means they will have a relationship. God's true sheep will follow the shepherd's voice. 12, last one. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, even as a father, the son in whom he delights. Again, as I explained in verse 11, God corrects who he loves, just like a father delights in the son. God's correction is beautiful for the Christian. You will know by one's lifestyle who has been corrected by God because they what? They live in obedience. Those who think they can still live in habitual sin, they have not been corrected by God. Or they refuse. They're just in rebellion to him. Those are the ones, the ones who live in obedience are the ones that God what? Delights in. God will not leave a true Christian in habitual sin. Let me say that again. God will not leave a true Christian that he loves in habitual sin because he, because his love disciplines and the Christian obeys. God's discipline never hurts us. It's only, it only helps us and by their fruit you will see who God loves and who loves him in return by their obedience to him all right so that's that and our prayer is um I'm just gonna recap I'm gonna put this into our prayer and that's a good thing about when you do read the Bible is that you can then take those words and incorporate to to your prayer if you don't know God and you don't know his word then you really don't know what to say when you pray all right so here we go Heavenly Father Lord your your wisdom alone is what we need to accept your correction help people see your discipline is love and only you know best. We surrender to your commands as they are written on the tables of our hearts. You alone are to be trusted to lead us in this life. We, re we want to release all control to you. We are your servants and ambassadors to, re to represent you in this wicked world. And we need your guidance on how you want us to use your substance substances to honor you alone. We are weak and you alone are strong and we need your grace to continue teaching us holiness. We surrender to your will and not our own. Use us to show others the inner peace you alone can bring. We also pray for Israel as we know their dry bones will also come alive very soon. In Jesus name, amen.